Hi everyone, my name is Leanne and today I'm going to be wrapping up the 14 books that I read in August. So little mini reviews of all of the books that I read during the month. I've been in quite a weird reading mood and I think gradually in August I started to get my reading mojo back a little bit. All of the books I talk about will be linked down below in the description if you want to find out more about them. I'm going to start with the fiction for adults, then the YA and kids fiction, then a little segue into poetry and then I'm going to do non-fiction. I'm going to start with my favourite book that I read in August and it's a book that I want so many more people to read and that is This Green and Pleasant Land by Ayesha Malik. I'd read two of her previous novels which are the Sophia Khan duology. This book is less romance focused than those books are. This was just such a fantastic read. This book follows a young English Pakistani family who are Muslim. They live in this really like quaint English village. I think it's in the Midlands and it follows what happens when on her deathbed Bilal's mother says that her dying wish is for him to build a mosque in this village and when Bilal decides he's going to do that it's a pretty controversial topic in this little town. As a reader, you get to witness a lot of the racism that this family faces and how everyone in this village was quite happy to accept this Muslim family until they started to act too Muslim. And all of that means is that they wanted a place of worship. That's it. It's really tender and insightful and ultimately has a very uplifting ending. And if you are interested in the kind of divisions that exist in these kind of small English communities, I would really recommend reading this book. I got a lot of insight from it, but it was also a really enjoyable and cozy read. I honestly just cannot recommend this book enough. I think it was fantastic. I also read Here is the Beehive by Sarah Crossan. Sarah Crossan is probably best well known for the novel One and her YA fiction. This is her adult fiction debut. But like her YA fiction, this book is also told in verse, which is something that I always really enjoy. I don't think there was anything wrong with the writing in this book. However, I really failed to connect with any of the characters. So in this book, we follow the aftermath of a man dying and we follow the grief experience Experienced by the woman that he was having an affair with. Both of these people in this affair were married to other people and because of that I just didn't feel any sympathy for them. I didn't understand this woman's point of view really. Both of them seem really unlikable. You hear about this guy, you know, from when he was alive. You hear about him through stories that she tells. Both of them just seem really unlikable. Their actions seem entirely unjustifiable. I think there's nothing wrong with their being unlikable characters, but I have to be able to connect with them in some way. I have to be able to understand their motivations. And from what I can tell, their motivations were just they were bored and thought they could get away with it. Which of course is the lived experience of a lot of people. I just I just don't like cheating, which seems like a really like obvious thing to say, but I just didn't care for this woman at all. I still think it's really well written and you do get an insight into this character and it is a fantastic character study I think but I just couldn't connect with it at all. I also read Love After Love by Ingrid Prasad and I thought this novel was fantastic. This is an adult novel that follows the perspective of three different people and it is set in Trinidad and New York. We follow Betty who is a young widow and we learn that her husband has died but there are also some very dark things in her past to do with that. We also follow her son Solo who after learning about some of these family secrets decides to move in with his uncle in New York and it follows his journey trying to find his feet there. And we also follow Mr. Chayton who is like their lodger but also like a really good friend of Betty. He is a gay man who has come to understand and experience his sexuality later in life and we follow his experiences of what it's like to be a gay man in Trinidad and some of the difficulties he faces because of that. I thought all three of these perspectives were really interesting. I thought all of their stories were woven together really seamlessly. Ultimately this is a novel about these three characters struggling to accept love from other people including amongst themselves and I just thought it was absolutely fantastic. What I will say is that there are like content warnings for this book. The book opens with a scene of domestic violence although you don't witness any domestic violence after that but there are some very graphic self-harm scenes which I found extremely uncomfortable to read. Fortunately I was in like a mental space where I was okay to deal with that but on a different day I think I would have found it extraordinarily difficult to read so do be aware going into it. It's a really insightful book, it's multi-layered, I really highly recommend it. Next I read a short story collection and that is This Hostile Life by Malatu Uchikori. Apologies if I've pronounced that name wrong, if you do know how to pronounce it 
I really welcome being corrected in the comments. So all of these stories are set in Ireland and they follow the experiences of immigrants and refugees who have come into Ireland. They all look at very specific moments in people's life but they stand to represent something bigger about these people's experiences moving to Ireland. And these are definitely not seamless or easy experiences as you might expect from a country who basically uses the branding slogan Cade Mila Falcha which means 100,000 welcomes. We follow the experiences of refugees in what is called direct provision which is one of the most disgusting things. Direct provision is basically a system of accommodation where refugees stay while their application is being processed. The idea behind this is that all of their basic needs are met which is not actually the case and these people's lives are really dictated and they don't have any kind of agency or independence. In fact, this system of direct provision has been heavily criticised by human rights organisations as being illegal, inhumane and degrading and we have seen, we have seen many stark results of this inadequate accommodation during this pandemic. Direct provision should not be a system that exists in my opinion and in the opinions of many others and yet it continues to exist. If you want to learn more about direct provision I can highly recommend reading this short story collection as a way of learning about it through fiction but I would also really encourage you to learn more about it from non-fiction sources and have a little google, learn a bit more about it because I think a lot of people have this perception of Ireland being super welcoming and this incredible like utopia and that is not the case. There are lots of problems in this country and direct provision is absolutely vile. If you thought the next book might get a bit cheerier that is not the case because I'm going to be talking about What Red Was by Rosie Price. This is a book that really heavily deals with the trauma faced by a woman after she is raped so if you don't want to hear me talk about that I'll put a little timestamp here so you can see which bit of the video to skip forward to in case you don't want to hear me talk about that. So this book is centred around the friendship between Kate and Max and it mainly focuses on Kate's perspective, although we do hear from Max's point of view, Max's mother's point of view and a few other points of view as well. I thought seeing through all those different points of view was done really really well and I think it made total sense when we see from different people. Kate and Max meet while they are at university and become firm friends very quickly. At the end of university Kate goes to stay with Max's family who are very wealthy and when she is staying there Kate is raped. The book then follows Kate grappling with her trauma, trying to understand what has happened to her. This is another book that does feature self-harm so again that should be something you need to be aware of going into this. It definitely is a book that is very difficult to read. Kate is a character that you really root for and support and want to take care of. The friendship she has with Max is really touching. I think it feels like a really genuine touching friendship. They're two characters who no matter what kind of happens to them, what goes on in their lives, they always end up finding their way back to one another. I did think this was a really fantastic book but of course a very difficult one to read. Next I read Pizza Girl by Jean Hyung Fraser and this kind of bridges the gap between me talking about adult fiction and YA fiction because this is a book for grown-ups but it does have a teenage protagonist. In this book we follow an 18 year old protagonist who is pregnant and she also works in a pizza shop and like takes orders and does deliveries. We follow her experiences of not being very enthusiastic about her pregnancy but her mother and her partner really are. Our main character develops what can really be called an obsession with one of her customers. Jenny is a stay at home mother who is new to the neighbourhood and she and our main character develop this very intense friendship and something more. I thought this book was really great and it showed a lot of perspectives around motherhood that we don't often see. It's a really short book but manages to pack in a lot without it feeling like it's moving too fast. I really wish I could love this book more than I do, however I had a lot of problems with how the bisexual representation is done in this book. I don't think any of the characters explicitly say that they're bisexual but there are characters who are interested in both men and women and all of these characters cheat. <laughs> and I just found that such a shame. I mean, there is so little representation of people with a sexuality that is could be considered bisexual, pansexual, queer, and for all of the representation in this book to involve cheating, I, I just found it really disappointing. Like, at the very start of the book, there is a character who isn't even really relevant to the story, and we are immediately introduced to them. I think it's in, like, the first or the second page as a character who is interested in both men and women cheating. It's such a stereotype that bisexual people have to deal with and I just wish it hadn't have been all of them, you know? I did really enjoy this story and I found the characters really interesting so I do just find it such a shame that there was this 
problem that really didn't need to be there. An absolutely fantastic book that I read in August was Knife Edge by Mallory Blackman. This is the second book in the Knots and Crosses series so I can't go into it in too much detail but I can tell you a little bit about the series overall. In the Knots and Crosses world people are divided into being knots and crosses. Knots being white people and crosses being black people. In the sort of social hierarchy, the crosses have the power. Crosses have far more privilege than knots, so it essentially it flips our world on its head. In the first book we follow the growing friendship and romantic relationship between Callum and Sefi. Sefi is a cross who has a lot of privilege because of who her father is. He's very wealthy, he's in the government. And Callum is a knot whose family becomes increasingly involved in uprisings and rebellions against these structural power. In Knife Edge we continue to see from Sefi's perspective as well as Callum's brother Judd. We also get moments from both of their mothers. And I can't really tell you more about the plot of this one but it follows their stories and we see more of like the rebellions and uprisings. So I'm two books into this series and I think it's possibly the best series of books I have ever read. What Mallory Blackman is conveying to her reader through flipping these structures the other way around is really fascinating. The commentary that she gives on racism is necessary and done so well. Also these books are just brilliantly page turning. Honestly just cannot recommend the series enough. I'm really excited to read the next books in the series. Sticking with YA I also read Burn Our Bodies Down by Rory Power. You may know Rory Power as the writer of Wilder Girls. This book is also like a YA thriller horror. In this book we follow our teenage protagonist Margot who really wants to learn more about her family. The only family she has ever known is her mother. When she discovers an old photograph it leads her to a small farming town in Nebraska and against her mother's wishes Margot decides she wants to learn more about her family history and she goes and stays with her grandmother. From the moment she arrives there she realises there's a lot of weird things going on and being part of her family is treated with a lot of suspicion. I absolutely tore through this book. I read it so quickly because I just didn't want to put it down. It's creepy in the way that you are really rushing to the end to find out what is going on with this family. But what I really appreciated was it wasn't too gory. <laughs> like there's stuff that will make you feel creeped out but it's not like, it's not massively like bloody. I also really appreciated the really seamlessly and simply done queer representation there is in this book. Margot identifies as a lesbian and she uses that word explicitly which I am always happy with. <laughs> I really enjoyed it and I think the atmosphere that Rory Power sets is really sublime. I also read a middle grade book. This is High Rise Mystery by Sharna Jackson. In this book we follow two siblings who fancy themselves as detectives and it follows them trying to figure out a murder that has happened in the Tri and the Tri is a high rise apartment block that these girls live in. These siblings are packed with curiosity and it was so wonderful to see young characters that just want to learn about things but also have a real confidence about them. We follow the siblings as they are sneaking around, getting little bits of information from people, looking for clues and spotting things that the police don't manage to spot. I thought this book was a lot of fun and of course I can imagine for someone who is actually in the target demographic of this book, you know middle grade readers, it would be even more fun. I really highly recommend this book and this is published by Knights Of who are one of my favourite publishers. I think they're absolutely fantastic. Moving into poetry I have Slam You're Gonna Wanna Hear This which is edited by Nikita Gill and her poetry is also in this collection. It's an anthology of lots of spoken word or slam poets. This anthology is put together with younger readers in mind who want to learn more about this kind of poetry, how to get into it. All of the poems have a little introduction from the poet and are also followed by a little bit of writing advice. There's a really wide range of topics dealt with in this collection and the book is split up into those different categories. A lot of the poems deal with experiences of dual identities and all of the poets in this anthology are people of colour. If you know a young person who is looking to get into slam poetry or even you as an adult reader have an interest in it, I would really recommend this book. I discovered a lot of new voices from it as well as reading poems from poets that I really admired already. I really care about making poetry more accessible for young people and I think this book is a brilliant contribution to that. And the second poetry collection I have to talk to you about is My Darling from the Lions by Rachel Long. This is Rachel Long's debut collection and I am so impressed by the poems in this book. They're really emotional but also very politically insightful. The poems deal with race and gender and family and sexual experiences. Rachel Long is so specific with the details she includes in this poetry and it's those really specific moments that 
make the poems feel really universal. A lot of the poems have a real complexity to them, but Rachel Long has this amazing way of making them look simple and seamless. I really highly recommend this one. I'm also obsessed with this cover. Finally, I have three non-fiction books to talk to you about. The first of those is Sunny Side Up by Susan Cowman. You may know Susan as a Scottish comedian. A lot of you might be familiar with her from Strictly Come Dancing. I was a big fan of her work before she was on Strictly, but I am a huge Strictly fan. If you've had any conversations with me recently, I will have been talking about Strictly because I'm just obsessed with it. When Strictly comes on TV, I genuinely feel like my mental health improved. I really connected with Susan's first book, Cheer Up Love, where she talks about her experiences of depression and anxiety. And a lot of her really specific experiences were things that I really connected to and related to. And I found that really comforting and I felt like less alone. Susan's podcast is also something that offered me a huge amount of comfort when I was in possibly the worst mental health space I'd ever been in. In this book Susan is talking about moments of kindness and joy, talking about things that made her happy and also sharing her experiences and other people's experiences of moments of kindness and why it's so important to treat people with patience and, and just being nice. While I think those things are really important, I didn't quite connect to this book in the same way I did with her first book, which is completely fine. They are different things about different topics. I still really enjoyed Susan's voice and I did especially love the sections about Strictly. If you're a fan, I would recommend. I also read Invisible Women by Caroline Criado Perez. I'm not going to talk about this one too much because I feel like lots of other people have spoken about it and a lot of people have also alerted me to some quite transphobic things that are in this book and transphobic things that the author has said outside of this book. I do understand that a lot of the studies that she's talking about in this book are quite tricky to talk about in a trans inclusive way but you've got to make that work. It might be tricky, but you've got to do it. And I can definitely recognize moments in this book where she doesn't do that. This is a book that really delves into a lot of scientific studies or actually a gap in the data of these scientific studies and looks at how the world is really constructed to benefit men and with men's needs in mind and the needs of women being disregarded. Often not in a malicious way, just because there were no women in the room. I did learn a lot from this book. I learned a lot of things that really shocked me. But if you are gonna read this book, do be aware that she talks about gender and sex in quite a flippant way. I don't think she's consistent with where she uses those words. I think she uses them kind of interchangeably. So yes, I did get a lot from this book, but there are big problems with it like that. And finally, I read Future Sex, A New Kind of Free Love by Emily Witt. This was the last book that I read in the month. I feel like I should have spoken about these books in a different order because I'm ending on a bit of a downer. <laughs> this book is a collection of nine essays that are about sexual experiences, but also specifically how technology has fed into those experiences. So the author is looking at things like the porn industry, dating apps, cam girls, how technological developments have impacted those things. She's also looking at polyamory and birth control and what these things mean in the modern age. But reading this now, in 2020, I think this was published about five years ago, I found a lot of this really outdated, which, you know, isn't the fault of the book, it's the fault of me reading it five years too late. But I think even reading it then, I don't know how the author managed to make sex seem boring. A lot of the experiences the author is talking about are experiences that she doesn't really have any interest in partaking in herself. And because of that, it feels very detached. And I don't think she quite does credit to the industries and the topics that she's discussing. I just think if this was meant to be an interesting and unusual perspective, it wasn't. <laughs> I think especially if you are someone like me who is really interested in learning more about these topics and have done a fair bit of reading and learning around these industries and topics before, this book will fall a little flat. And maybe that is just because I'm reading it too late. I will be keeping this book in my library because this is kind of a little topic of nonfiction reading that I'm really interested in and I like having resources of books on these topics but it's not one that I would massively recommend. So there we have it. These are the books that I read in August, plus the ones I read digitally, of course. Leave me a comment down below and let me know if you've read any of these books and what you thought of them. Or you can let me know what you're currently reading. Or if you don't even have anything to say, just leave me a little emoji down in the comments. I'm trying to normalize that. I'm trying to do it myself, but also encourage others to do it where if you don't feel like you have anything to say, but you still want to show a creator that you enjoyed their video, just leave them a little emoji. It's a brilliant way of 
supporting creators and if you want to support this channel even more than that my coffee page and my wish list are linked down below in the description but as I said you can support me by leaving a comment or just subscribing to this channel anyways that's all I have to talk to you guys about today I hope you're well and I will talk to you in my next video